Hello, YouTube math people, society, community, family, or even cult, whatever you guys want to call this. Today we have a ridiculously awesome integral, and I haven't used that term in quite a while, not only during my videos, but also for titles and thumbnails. But this thing really is ridiculously awesome. I mean, look at it. We have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x minus cosine x divided by square root x times the natural logarithm of x. So yeah, this thing looks like a roller coaster of mathematical wonderfulness. And the solution development is extremely cool in that respect as well. And it makes use of a bunch of really nice tools and tricks. The first one is the Mellin transform of the sine and the cosine function. Now I've derived these transforms in a previous video using Ramanujan's master theorem, link in the description below, and I believe I made another video deriving the Mellin transform of sine x using an interesting approach. I'll link both videos in the, in the description box. So the Mellin transform of sine x is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times sine x dx. And this thing here equals the gamma function at s times the sine of pi s by 2. And we have a corresponding transform for the cosine function. It's Mellon transform cosine x equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times cosine x dx, this thing here equals gamma s times the cosine of pi s by 2. Now we could just take these tools and apply the various tricks that will follow and get a solution development for the target integral, or I could show you something really cool that I figured out later, and by later I mean once I actually solved the target integral, I realized we can generalize this for some interesting results, and by that, I mean we define the integral as an integral function, i of some parameter alpha, and that will be the integral from 0 to infinity of sine alpha x minus cosine alpha x divided by root x times log x dx. Now, if we want to parameterize the integral function, so we've transformed it a bit. Oh, by the way, alpha here is supposed to be a positive real number. So how would these Mellin transforms transform under this parameterization? Well, that's pretty easy. I'll just take these down here. Let me start off with the sine function here. Copy and paste. So for this transform, let me make another transformation by letting x here equal alpha times u, which implies that dx would of course be alpha times du. And that means we have the integral from 0 to infinity, the limits are clearly not bothered, of alpha to the s minus 1 times u to the s minus 1 times sine of alpha u times this alpha parameter due to the differential element. And this thing here would be equal to what exactly? Well, one alpha cancelled out here. So we have alpha to the s times the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the s minus 1 times the sine of alpha u du, which is the Mellon transform of this integral is the Mellon transform of sine alpha u. But we know what this integral was supposed to be equal to, right? The right-hand side is independent of the x or the u variables, so it just stays as gamma s times sine of pi s by 2. And on the right hand side we have this alpha to the s term, so that means expanding using alpha to the negative s, we have the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the s minus 1 times sine alpha u du equal to alpha to the negative s gamma s times sine pi s by 2. Okay, cool. And following exactly the same procedure, we realize that the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the s minus 1 times the cosine of alpha u du equals alpha to the negative s times gamma s times now the cosine of pi s by 2. Now that we have these transformed integrals, our next step is to recover a logarithm function because recall 
that the target integral did have a logarithm in it. And we can recover the logarithm quite easily from this term. And how exactly is that possible? Well, if we differentiate this partially with respect to s, we will get exactly the same term repeated times the logarithm of the constant base u or x, whatever you can rename the dummy variable back to x. It really, does, it really does not matter as long as the structure of the integral is intact. The name of the dummy variable does not matter. So we'll take the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times sine alpha x dx. We know that this equals alpha to the negative s times gamma s times sine of pi s by 2. And the plan here is to differentiate with respect to the s parameter. On the left-hand side, on switching up the order of the differentiation and integration operators, we have the integral from 0 to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to s of x to the s minus 1 times sine alpha x dx. And on the right-hand side, we have to apply the product rule quite a bit. So we'll be left with alpha to the negative s times log alpha times gamma s times the sine of pi s by 2 plus alpha to the negative s times gamma prime s, terribly sorry about that, times sine pi s by 2, plus now we have to differentiate the sine function, and because of the chain rule, we'll have a factor of pi by 2, so we have pi by 2 times alpha to the negative s, gamma s, cosine pi s by 2. And on the left-hand side, we're differentiating partially with respect to alpha, so that means all the non, uh, with respect to s, so that means all the non s terms are just going to be held constant. So differentiating x to the s minus 1 gives us x to the s minus 1 times log x. So let me just write that here. We have x to the s minus 1 times log x equal to this really nice structure on the right hand side. And by a similar token, we have the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times log x times cosine x dx equal to pretty much the same thing. We have alpha to the negative s log alpha times gamma s times the cosine this time of pi s by 2. And we have alpha to the negative s times gamma prime s again times cosine pi s by 2 minus sine, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we have pi by 2 times alpha to the negative s times gamma s times sine pi s by 2. Okay, cool. That was fun, but now what? So we have a couple of interesting integral results, but now we have to piece everything together to get the target integral that I've boxed in green here. And that does not seem very difficult at all. In fact, all we need is s equal to one half. Because if s equals one half, and you subtract this integral and this integral, and using the linearity of the integration operator, we have the integral from zero to infinity of sine alpha x minus cosine alpha x with the log x term being factored out. And if s equals 1 half, then s minus 1 is negative 1 half. So that means we have root x in the denominator and we've recovered the target integral. That was extremely cool. Also, we're subtracting one integral from the other. So notice first up that because sine of pi by 4 is equal to the cosine of pi by 4, we're actually getting rid of quite a few terms, like this term and this term, they cancel out. And same case over here, we're rid of the derivative of the gamma function. So I'm sorry, I could not invoke the digamma function this time. It was just a necessity. Anyway, we're left with this term minus this term. So that means we have the two negatives canceling out. We can just factor out pi by 2. We have alpha to the negative 1 half, which is good. We have gamma 1 half, always a welcome sight. And we have cosine pi by 4 plus sine pi by 4, which is, of course, equal to 2 times root 2. And we have some cancellation taking place. Gamma 1 half is famously equal to root pi. So that means we have pi uh -huh, divided by 2 times... No, wait, wait, wait. 
it's pi times root pi divided by 2 alpha. Okay, cool. That's a pretty interesting result. And for the target case, we just needed alpha equal to 1. So let me just plug that in real quick. So the target integral i equals pi times root pi by 2, which is pretty nice. But a really cool result would be if you let alpha here equal to 5. And I think regular viewers of the channel know where I'm going with this. So what if we let alpha equal to 5? Perfectly reasonable. 5 is a positive real number. It's a valid value for the alpha parameter, but why exactly do I want it equal to 5? Well, in that case, we have i of 5 equal to pi divided by pi divided by 2 times 5. I'm not writing this as 10. In fact, I'm just writing this as 1 by 5 in the square root. Why on earth do I want to do that? Let me explain. Well, 1 plus root 5 by 2 is the golden ratio. And this implies that root 5 is 2 times 5 minus 1. And this further implies that... What if I let alpha equal to 25? I think that would be really cool. Nah, forget it. This implies that pi, uh, that the value of i of 5 equals pi divided by 2 phi minus 1 times root pi by 2, which is a very cool result indeed. Was this necessary? Hell no, nah, man. It was not necessary at all. Was it cool? Hell yeah. You can derive interesting results by exaggerating the way we represent square roots of ordinary integers. That is a pretty interesting exercise indeed. Anyway, more important than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram as well. I post important write-ups and pretty much all the write-ups for my videos are posted over there as well as some important tools that I often invoke. And if you feel like I'm doing a good job here, if you're learning something from the channel, then do consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.